So I always like to read the translation for Radha Madhava <coughs> because sometimes we sing it every day but sometimes we may forget what it actually means. So the translation is Krishna is the lover of Vrindavan, uh, the, sorry, lover of Radha. He displays many amorous pastimes in the groves of Vrindavan. He is the lover of the cowherd maidens of Raja and the holder of the great hill named Govardhan. He is the beloved son of Mother Yasoda, the delighter of the inhabitants of Raja, and he wanders in the forest along the banks of the river Jamuna. Jai Radha Madhava. Nasta Parishu Bhajrishu Nityam Bhagavat Sevaya Bhagavate Utamashloke Bhakti Bhavati Nashtaki by regular attendance and classes on Srimad Bhagavatam and by rendering service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed and loving service unto the personality of Godhead who is praised with transcendental songs is established as an irrevocable fact. Omekniyana timirandasya ginangana shalakaya chakshuan militam yena tasmaya sigurave namaha Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Hare Krishna everyone Today we're reading from 2nd Canto chapter 10 <coughs> and we're on to verse 6 Niroto Shanushayanam Atmana Sahasaktibi Atmana Sahasaktibi Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Svarupena Vyavastiti Svarupena Vyavastiti Nirodho Shainu Shayanam Nirodha Shayanam Atmana Sahasaktibi Atmana Sahasaktibi Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Sarupena Vyavastiti Sarupena Vyavastiti Nirodho Syanu Shayanam Nirodho Syanu Shayanam Atmana Saha Shakti Bhi Atmana Saha Shakti Bhi Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Mukti Hitvan Yata Rupam Swarupena Vyavastiti Swarupena Vyavastiti No ladies present, they're all getting ready for the Preparation for Liana's wedding. Um, please repeat after me. Nirodha. The widening up of the cosmic manifestation. Asya. Of his. Anushayanam. The lying down of the Purusha incarnation Mahavishnu in mystic slumber. Atmanaha. Of the living entities. Saha, Saha, along with, along with Shakti with the energies, with the energies Mukti, Mukti, liberation, liberation Hitva, Hitva, giving up, up Anyata, otherwise, otherwise Rupam, Rupam form, form Svarupena, Svarupena in, constitutional in constitutional form Yavastiti, Yavastiti permanent, situation, permanent situation Translation, translation the merging of the living entity along with his conditional living tendency with the mystic lying down of the Mahavishnu is called the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. Liberation is the permanent situation of the form of the living entity after he gives up the changeable gross and subtle material bodies. Repeat after me. The merging of the living entity along with his conditional living tendency, with the mystic lying down of the Mahavishnu, is called the winding up of the cosmic manifestation, 
Liberation is the permanent situation, the permanent situation of, the of the form of the living entity after he gives up the changeable gross, the changeable gross and, subtle and subtle material bodies. So reading from the poor thought. As we have discussed several times, there are two types of living entities. Most of them are ever liberated or nitya muktas, while some of them are ever conditioned. The ever conditioned souls are apt to develop a mentality of lording over the material nature, and therefore the material cosmic creation is manifested to give the ever conditioned souls two kinds of facility. One facility is that the conditioned soul can act according to his tendency to lord it over the cosmic manifestation. And the other facility gives the conditioned soul a chance to come back to Godhead. So, after the winding up of the cosmic manifestation, most of the conditioned souls merge into the existence of the Mahavishnu personality of Godhead, lying in his mystic slumber to be created again in the next creation. But some of the conditioned souls who follow the transcendental sound in the form of Vedic literatures are thus able to go back to Godhead, attain spiritual and original bodies after quitting the conditional gross and subtle material bodies. The material conditional bodies develop out of the living entity's forgetfulness of their relationship with Godhead. And during the course of the cosmic manifestation, the conditioned souls are given a chance to revive their original status of life with the help of revealed scriptures, so mercifully compiled by the Lord in his different incarnations. Reading or hearing of such transcendental literatures helps one become liberated even in the conditional state, state of material existence. All the Vedic literatures aim at devotional service to the personality of Godhead, and as soon as one is fixed upon this point, he at once becomes liberated from conditional life. The material gross and subtle forms are simply due to the conditioned soul's ignorance, and as soon as he is fixed in the devotional service of the Lord, he becomes eligible to be freed from the conditioned state. This devotional service is transcendental attraction for the Supreme on account of his being the source of all pleasing humours. Everyone is after some pleasure of humour for enjoyment, but does not know the Supreme source of all attraction. Rasovyaisa rasam yevayam lab vanandi bhavati. The Vedic hymns inform everyone about the Supreme source of all pleasure. The unlimited fountainhead of all pleasure is the, is the personality of Godhead. And one who is fortunate enough to get this information through transcendental literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam becomes permanently liberated to occupy his proper place in the kingdom of God. How fortunate are we to be hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from the person Bhagavat, the pure devotee, and we can't actually perceive of our good fortune. Sometimes when we're having, you know, moments of deep reflection, we can understand to a degree what mercy, how do we get this mercy? So it's something that we really want to be always focusing on. So we're now into the sixth verse of this tenth, tenth chapter, the cosmic manifestation. And in the second last verse before we began chapter 10, in chapter 9, which is entitled Bhagavatam, the answer to all questions, it pauses one to think about, well, how does Srimad Bhagavatam answer all the questions? And just like Prabhupada's saying here, that when you have that opportunity to hear Srimad Bhagavatam, particularly from the mouth of the pure devotee, how fortunate we are. So why do you think Srimad Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions? 
Anyone venture a, a suggestion? Krishna, Krishna Krita? Yes, and it's transcendental. It's pure. And the Vedas is said to be the breath of the Lord. And that breath of the Lord was inhaled by Lord Brahma, the original student of the Vedas. And so by Krishna's mercy, Lord Brahma being the first living being in the universe, he was enlightened and he handed down that knowledge just like the beautiful mango from the top of the tree handed it down intact. But when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, and I think uh, Ramai Maharaj mentioned this yesterday, when we read Srimad Bhagavatam, sometimes it can seem very um, difficult, of course, to understand and also comprehend with our minute level of experience and realisation. And part of the understanding of Srimad Bhagavatam and the ability to absorb Srimad Bhagavatam is based on shraddha, which is faith. And how do we get faith? None of us had faith when we first came to Krishna consciousness. You know, we either like reading the books or we like the devotees or we like the chanting. Um, some of us really love the prasadam. So that faith is developed by exactly what we're doing now, which is shadu shanga. So when we associate with like-minded people, even though our faith may be a little shaky, it may not even be... Um, even there initially by that development and that association and the chanting of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra then faith becomes fixed in our hearts and very strong but our senses and experience are very limited and there's a and I've, I've mentioned this example before but there was a um, I forget his name, Ramai Maharaj would remember his name, he was in a lecture in Melbourne and Prabhupada was giving the lecture. And uh, when it was time for questions, he said to Srila Prabhupada, so Srila Prabhupada, when we read about the swan carrier of Lord Brahma, so are we to understand that symbolical? That it's actually not real, it's just a symbol for something? And Prabhupada, you know, looked at him very firmly and he said, what do you know with your tiny brain and your tiny experience? So we think we've got this vast source of knowledge, we're sophisticated, we know about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and what caused the floods, we know about, um, you know, we have our theories about COVID, but actually we know so little. And Prabhupada points out that we don't even know this planet, let alone the universe, let alone all the other universes. So we need to um, understand that this knowledge is pure. It's handed down by the great, great Acharyas. And sometimes, you know, I would think, okay, I really can't grasp at this. I can't, how is this feasible? How is this possible? And then I always think, well, it's good enough for Srila Prabhupada. It's good enough for Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur. It's good enough for Bhakti Vinod Thakur and going all the way through our dissipative succession, then it's certainly good enough for me in my very conditioned state. So being received in this chain of dissipative succession, this knowledge is perfect. We're the ones that are trying to reach the perfection. Um, so... You know, Vyasadeva has done very wonderful things in compiling the Vedas. We know the, the history of that, how he was feeling discontented when he, after he divided the, the Vedas, the one Veda into the four, he still felt discon discontented. And then Narada Muni pointed out to him, well, actually, it's because you have not spoken about the personality of Godhead and his activities. So that's when he... Um, compiled the um, Vedanta Sutra, Srimad Bhagavatam, etc. So the first word in this verse is Narodha, the winding up of the cosmic manifestation. And I noticed in Prabhupada's lectures he would often isolate particular words and then he would speak to those um, Sanskrit words, the Sanskrit. So Narodha is actually the eighth subject out of ten subjects of Srimad Bhagavatam. 
and Vinod um, Prabhu is going to talk in depth about those um, 10 topics, I believe, tomorrow. So bring your notebooks. Um, I actually tried to write them on the back of this board, but it's covered in indelible it's a scribble. So if anyone's looking for a service, can someone please clean the back of that, that board? So in that verse, Atra Sago Sagas Cha Stanam Poshnam Utaya, Manvantare Shanu Kata Nurodho Mukti Asraya. And Srimad Bhagavatam says, Shukadev Goswami is speaking. He says, In the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are ten divisions, this is going back to verse one of this chapter, of statements regarding the following. There's the creation of the universe. There's the sub-creation, which is Lord Brahma's secondary creation. There's the planetary systems and their divisions. Then there's the protection by the Lord, the creative impetus, the um, activities that the living entities are impelled to perform, the change of the Manus, the science of God, the science of Bhakti Yoga, and then returning home back to Godhead, and the Summon Bonum, which is, which is Ashray Tattva. So I had tried to write these on the board and it's just would not have been able to see them. So I'm just going to describe in a little detail in preparation for Vinod's class tomorrow. So this saga is the universal creation by the Supreme Lord. Vishaga is the secondary creation by Lord Brahma. Stana is the positioning of the living entities in the planetary systems and those who are abiding by the law of the Lord. Poshanam is the Lord's protection of the devotees, particularly focusing here on the, those who are following the laws of God, the devotees. Then Uti is the inclination to act, or the impetus for work. And Manvantara talks about the reign of the Manus. And Ishanu Kata are the topics of the Lord's various incarnations and his devotees. And then Nirodha, which is the word that we're looking at here, is the annihilation or the winding up of the creation. And then there's Mukti, which is liberation. <coughs> and the true liberation is Jivaya Nitya Krishna Das, eternally the servant of Krishna. Jivaya Sriripoy Krishna Nitya Das. Very, very important that we understand our constitutional position as a living entity. So this whole concept of Sanatan Dharma is very interesting because you have Sanatan Dharma, which is the spiritual world, the place. Then you have the Lord, who's also Sanatan Dharma. And then you have the Jiva, the Tatashta Shakti, the marginal energy. And our constitutional position is also eternal. And when we come to that point of understanding that I'm not trying to serve myself, my own senses, my own um, program, my career path or all my ambitions, but we understand that what is our core, what is our real constitutional position, and that's to be servant. And even greater than being servant of the Lord is being servant of his devotee. And Krishna himself says, Better than serving me, better than worshipping me, is the worship of my um, devotees. So that's a very important um, point to, for us to always meditate on, and we hear it a lot. So those, to those ten topics or divisions that I describe, or that are described, they're, they're throughout spread, it's all throughout the Bhagavatam. So it's not that, um, you know, these are like progressive things, they're spread everywhere. So in, in, I think, 12th canto, they talk about Nirodha again. But there are also some specific cantos that deal specifically with those particular um, things. So, for example, I managed to pick out some examples. So um, in 3rd and 4th canto, it describes the Saga and Vishaga. So that's the creation and the secondary creation. And that takes place between the conversation between Vidura and Maitreya. And then in the fifth canto, there's discussions about Stanam, the positioning of the living uh, entities in the different planetary systems. 
Sixth canto focus on, on Koshinam or the protection of the Lord. Seventh canto describes Uti or inclination. What are the activities of the living entities? Eighth canto, for example, about the Manus. Ninth canto, uh, the topics of the Lord, Ishanu Kata, Kata is the topics of the Lord and his devotees. Tenth is Ashray Tatra, that summon Bonum, Bonum, that perfect um, shelter of the absolute truth, which is Krishna. So um, if we look at Narodha, we've got the annihilation. Now, there are a number of, in some places in Bhagavatam it describes that there are two kinds of dissolution or annihilation. That which comes at the end of Brahma's uh, day when he's sleeping, that's the partial dissolution. Then there's the full dissolution, dissolution that comes at the end of his life. And there's also the dissolution um, where uh, Ananta breathes fire. This, this four, partial, conditional, various ones. So this one particular, in particular is the partial dis dissolution. And in uh, eighth chapter, verse 18 of Bhagavad Gita, this is described. So the partial dissolution happens at the end of Brahma's day. So, how long is his day? Yes. Thousand cycles of the four yugas is four billion. Did you say four? Yes. Three, actually, four billion three hundred and twenty million years, but that's good. And those numbers are just beyond our, our comprehension. And one thing I've noticed in, in my study of, of our literature, Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, there's lots of things about numbers. There's always numbers of everything. I don't know if everyone else has noticed that, but we've got so many numberings, the three modes, the nine processes of devotional service, all of these different, the ten divisions, and in Chaitanya Charitamrita Char it talks about the 14 categories. It's really interesting, particularly if you like numbers, um, a bit harder to remember. So the 4,322,000,000 years is his day. And then he sleeps, and then everything is wound up, up to the higher planetary systems, just the lower ones. Uh, dissolved and then all the living entities are absorbed and then when he wakes up again they are manifest so um, so the Mahatattva and the marginal energy called the Jiva Tattva they merge into the person of the Supreme Lord so they're there in um, they've still got their desires their inclinations but then there's no action. And then when Brahma wakes, again it all becomes manifest. And because there's still material conditioning for the jiva, again they're forced to um, take birth according to their desires. And we all know about the other magic three, which is the three different kinds of energies of the Lord. Antaranga Shakti, Tatashta Shakti, Bahiranga Bahiranga Shakti. So, the internal energy, the marginal energy, and the external energy. So we we all remain asleep. The living beings remain asleep within the body of the Lord, and then there's another creation, and again we all get rolled out. There's a big rollout. But every individual soul does remain unconscious after the dissolution of the creation and thus enters into the Lord with his material energy. So these living entities are what Prabhupada described in this purport as the um, ever-conditioned, the Nichabhadas. The Nichasiddhas are those who are always um, liberated, they're always understanding what their role is, who they are, who Krishna is. And Prabhupada in a lecture I heard recently, Prabhupada was saying that even the Nitya Siddhas, um, they're, when they're instructed by the order of the Lord to come to the material world, they never 
are touched, never touched by the material energy. They're always in that um, unconditioned state. And we consider Srila Prabhupada as a Nitya Siddha. And Prabhupada himself said, never was a time that I didn't remember Krishna. So we can, um, you know, meditate on that, which is very, very nice. And then in 12th Canto, um, it goes into more detailed descriptions about the annihilations. There's Nainitika, or occasional annihilation, and that's the one that occurs during Brahma's night, which is that part of the dissolution. And the three planetary systems, as I said, up to Lord Brahma, they're annihilated. And then at the end of Brahma's life, there is the total material annihilation, and that's called Prakritika. And that time, the seven elements of material nature, beginning with the Mahatattva and the universal egg composed of them, are destroyed. So, it, it, I mean, all these technical things, I, I really like the technical details. I find it really fascinating. And I remember many, many, many years ago, when I was kind of giving some classes to the Bhaktins in Sydney. It's the time when Krishna Kirtan was there. And I used to give them classes of creation, about creation. And <laughs> decades later, I was speaking to one of the Bhaktins. Um, she said, oh yeah, I remember your classes, Krishna Rupa, about creation. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> so it's very hard to conceive of it, but the technicality is very interesting because we can understand how vast and how wonderful this knowledge is. Um, so we're, we don't have very much time, but um, the, returning to those ten topics, the first nine topics are actually focusing on how do we get to the tenth or realization of the tenth, which is the Asrai Tattva. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And um, in teachings of Lord Chaitanya, Prabhupada describes Asraya Tattva as follows, and I'll, I'll read it out. The Supreme Truth is the shelter of all manifestations and is called Asraya. All other principles which remain under the control of the Asraya Tattva all the absolute truth are called asrita, or subordinate corollaries and, corollaries and reactions. The purpose of the material manifestation is to give the conditioned soul a chance to attain liberation and return to the ashray tattva of the absolute truth. So the whole purpose that Krishna has created this material manifestation is simply for us, because we had this mood of competition with Krishna. Some places Prabhupada describes it as envy of the Lord. Other places he, he describes it as competition. That we wanted to share in some of the, the glory, so to speak. So Krishna is so kind. He creates this wonderful manifestation for us for one purpose only. And that's how to get out of the prison. How to be relieved of all of our material suffering and we we suffer constantly like Maharaj was pointing out yesterday Adi David Klesh, Adi Bhotik Klesh and what's the third one? Adi Atmik Adi Atmik Klesh we're suffering from our own minds our own bodies, we're suffering um, through other living entities and then we're suffering from the, the demigods with the crazy weather which we're all you know, at the receiving end at the moment. So there's always this path of suffering. When we think that we can actually just enjoy, we know that we're not going to be able to. And in Bhagavatam it describes that the proportion between enjoyment and the reaction to enjoyment is not parallel. So if you engage in sense gratification, it's not that you get punished or taught a lesson on the same level. No, you always suffer more. Always. It's just a fact. So you get, you eke out a little bit of enjoyment somehow or other and you think, okay, alright, I might have to suffer a little bit for that. No, you'll suffer a lot. 
and it's there in Shiva Bhagavatam. So it's it's kind of worth remembering that thing. Oh, okay, this is kind of pretty good. Oh, hang on a second. What reaction am I going to get for that? So, um, and the re and the reason why these nine topics are going in gradation, or as we call in in publishing terms, progressive delivery, is because we need to um, develop that understanding of who Krishna is. And that's why Srila Prabhupada instructed us many, many times, it's there in Bhagavatam itself, that we actually must progressively read and study Bhagavatam. We don't leap from first canto to sixth canto, back to fourth canto, up to ninth canto, you know, leaping around like a grasshopper. We make a steady, progressive study of Bhagavatam. So when we reach the tenth canto, we have chance of a better understanding of, of Krishna's um, true nature. So, um, yes, there's that verse in, in the Gita, Brahma, Bhuvana, Loka, Puna, Avrita, Arjuna, that's always reminding us that from the highest planet, even the demigods, even Lord Brahma, even Lord Indra and their wonderful um, lives, they also are suffering. Lord Indra is always concerned that he's going to be usurped. Lord Brahma is trying to deal with demons like Hiranyakashipu, who's trying to work around, you know, to get eternal life. There's nothing that's um, perfect in this material world. And of course, Lord Brahma has to leave his body. And if he's a devotee of the Lord, then he'll go back to Godhead. If not, then he has to go through the cycle again. So... To conclude this segment, the purification and realisation takes place the more we practice sadhana bhakti. So we're all making our incremental baby steps. Some are making bigger steps, some are making smaller steps, but we're all on that path. And once we're on that path of sadhana bhakti, Krishna will always remember our service. It's very wonderful actually that even though we may perform, you know, small service, not significant service, and then we may leave, Krishna never forgets, and we will come back again into the, the arms of the Lord, into the practice of sadhana bhakti. So, um, you know, in the morning program, we're attending Bhagavatam, and Mahatma Prabhu said a very nice thing. I was listening to one of his um, little short talks the other day. And he was talking about Japa. And he said, Japa is your private time with the Lord. And that really inspired me. Because when I start chanting my Japa, I think, okay, now this is my private time with Krishna. It's just me and Krishna. And we're, we're chanting quietly. And then we all come together in Kirtan. And that's our communal sharing of our time with Krishna, which is very wonderful. So um, we're individually calling out to Krishna, oh my Lord, oh energy of the, Lord, of the Lord, please engage me in your service. Prabhupada said at times the Maha Mantra means, oh my friend, oh my friend, oh my friend, we're calling out to Krishna. And of course when we do it collectively, we have that wonderful coming together as devotees. So today is the uh, appearance day of Ramanujra Acharya, and I just want to speak very briefly about him. So in 2017, he, it was his 1,000th appearance day. So that means that's 1,005, 1,005th appearance day today. So he appeared in the 11th century um, in India. And he's the principal acharya of the Sri or Lakshmi Sampradaya. And as you know, we have the four bona fide Sampradayas, and he is the principal acharya for um, the Sri. So we have, what are some of the Sampradayas that we have? Rudra. 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 Rimbaka. Rimbaka. That's, well, he follows Rudra. Oh, sorry, he's the Kumara. The Kumara Sampradaya. So we've got Brahma Madhva Sampradaya, which is Lord Brahma Sampradaya, and this is the Sampradaya that we belong to. 
We've got the Sri Sampradaya, which the principal acharya is Ramanuja, and we have Vishnu Swami leading up the um, uh, Rudra, and then Kumara by Nimbaka. So Prabhupada describes that these four original Sampradayas, they excrupulously engage in devotional service of the Lord. So we've got 13 upper Sampradayas, but we have the four bona fide Sampradayas. So anyone who's following those Sampradayas are bona fide devotees of the Lord. And um, in Ramanujra, I'm just going to read something. It was a letter that Prabhupada wrote about um, Ramanuja, uh, Ramanuja. In a, it's from a letter of um, 1974, November 22nd. Prabhupada wrote, We find great shelter at the lotus feet of Sri Ramanuja Charya because his lotus feet are the strongest fort to combat the Mayavadi philosophy. So he actually, he and Madhavacharya, they destroyed Mayavad. So we know that evolution that we had um, you know, people following the Vedas, then following it improperly, um, using the Vedas to uh, make excuses for cow slaughter, etc. Then we had Krishna appearing as Buddha to take them away from that Vedic um, way of life because it was becoming perverted and corrupted. And then we had Shankaracharya appearing to, you know, re-establish um, Vedic, but the Mayavad side. It's all a very nice evolution. And then we had Madhvacharya, Ramanujacharya, coming back to slam Mayavad. It's all in this, you know, progressive delivery. So, um, and Giriraj Swami said that in the early days of ISKCON in India, before we had Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is in Hindi, He's talking about Hindi. Prabhupada recommended that um, oh, he would refer people to read the Hindi edition of the Gita with Ramanuja Charya's commentary. So I found that was very interested, interesting. And he often told a story about Ramanuja Charya's merciful, compassionate nature. And in Amdabad, Prabhupada said this. He said, the servants of Krishna take all risk for Krishna's sake, just like Ramanuja Charya. Sri Ramanujacharya's spiritual master said, who was Ramanujacharya's spiritual master? Jamunacharya. He said, my dear son, this is, you've probably heard this before, my dear son, the mantra which I'm giving you, chant silently and you will be delivered. It's so powerful. Don't chant this mantra loudly so others can hear. And Ramanujacharya thought, if this mantra is so powerful and it can give me liberation, then I have to share it, even if I'm going to um, be in big trouble for my spiritual master. So he went to the market and began to chant the mantra loudly. And then his spiritual master became very, very angry. And he said, I told you not to chant loudly so that others may not hear. And Ramanuja Acharya replied, My Lordship, I have done offence unto you. That's all right. For this I'm prepared to go to hell. But if this mantra is so powerful... I must speak it to everyone. That's the mercy of Ramanuja Acharya. And uh, yeah, there's a lot about Ramanuja Acharya. Um, Lord Chaitanya is cited in the Navadvip Mahatma, Mahatmya. He says, later when I begin the Sankirtan movement, I myself will preach the essence of the four Vedic Vaishnava philosophies. From Ramanuja, I will accept two great teachings the concept of bhakti unpolluted by karma and jnana and service to the devotees. And he, he goes on to describe all the different things. So um, there's a lot we can say about Ramanujacharya, but time is moving on. He remembered everything that he heard. He was a great scholar, a very beautiful personality. He... Um, his father was a, a learned Brahmana expert in Jagya. Uh, his mother was very qualified. Um, he got married at a young age. When his father was 16, he passed away. So then he moved to 
country. Um, he set up a school there. He got it. He came, became in contact with um, a very great Mayavadi philosopher, who ended up being defeated by Ramanuja Acharya, and he. Um, he, he got into quite a bit of trouble when he was dealing with that. I'm just trying to see if I can find the name of that material. I can't remember it. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yadava? Yadava Pakasha. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes, so, you know, he, uh, he couldn't stand hearing Yadava Pakasha's um, description of Krishna and, you know, with his Mayavadi slant and then... Ramanuja Acharya actually defeated him. Well, he went to his school and he was tutored. Yes, yes. And then, um, you know, when he, 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 he started to um, defeat that philosophy, he had to leave. Then he set up his own school. Yadava is small. But even Yadava, after that incident, he began to reflect that Ramanuja was not an ordinary personality, he wasn't an ordinary well he still was a boy and he thought if he starts his own school the philosophy of devotion might become a threat to the philosophy of non-dualism he should be killed so he tried to have him assassinated but the plan was foiled and um, Lord Ram himself manifested and guided him back to um, Kanchi safely so very wonderful, and if you go on to uh, the history of the uh, Gaudiya history, you can read a lot about Ramanuja Acharya. It's very detailed there. So I'll finish now. Thank you very much for listening. If there's any um, comments, corrections, questions? Yes, yes. I think you said it the other way. Oh, did I? Yeah. So it's an interesting description of that, that actually uh, Lord Ramana himself uh, goes into a yoga nidra in his sleep, and yeah, he actually goes into the body of the garden of Krishna. The normal planet with the gold, they're lying in the body of the garden of ocean. Now, I have read that the living entities go into uh, the body of Brahma. And, and like I was saying, I wish someone had been able to give a microphone to Maharaj so oh, that could have been recorded. <laughs> um, but yes, there's... Yeah, no, thank you very much, Maharaj. The, the whole process of, of annihilation, creation, annihilation, you know, it's very, very layered. It's multi-layered. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for pointing that out. I, I would answer that in a purely speculative way. So, if Maharaj has a, 
a precise answer, but I, I would say that, you know, everyone gets tired. <laughs> but I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't give you a, a you know, a sustric reason for why is the purpose of sleeping. Why do we all sleep? You know, it's <laughs> that's how I would no, answer I that. Can you give that to Maharaj? No, I'm just saying I haven't read a specific oh, answer. Okay. There probably is one, but I haven't read it. So uh, Ramai Swami was just saying that he hasn't actually read a specific um, explanation to Vinod's very good question. What it's is the... Yes, I, I, I haven't I haven't read one, but it stands to reason. Yes. Yes. Vinod, you can contact him. <laughs> I'll I'll ask him I'll ask him at the next um, ERP meeting, and <laughs> I'll corner him there and ask him for you. <laughs> Pardon? Yes. It is so, so what is this that, you know, the Lord can't rest? <laughs> what is this that, you know, that the manifestation has to be always happening? And that's why we rest. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Than, than, than my guesswork. <laughs> Good question. Well, yes. You know. All right. Thank you very much for your patience, everyone. Hare Krishna, glorious Sri Prabhupada.